Hi, welcome to Foreign Affairs Focus. I'm Jonathan Tepperman, Managing Editor of Foreign Affairs. It's my great pleasure to have with us today Kevin Rudd, uh, who has the distinction of not only being a former Foreign Minister of Australia, not only being a former Prime Minister of Australia, but being a true bona fide world-class uh, intellectual and scholar on China. Um, so that's what I'd like to ask him about today. Mr. Rudd, before we get to China, uh, let's ask about um, their querulous neighbor, which is dominating the news right now. Um, tensions with South Korea, with, excuse me, with North Korea have ratcheted up dramatically in the last few weeks. Um, but what to make of them can be confusing because on one hand we have pundits and until recently even the U.S. government saying this is typical uh, North Korean behavior, trying to maneuver for advantage. On the other hand, we see signs like the U.S. military's decision to deploy new anti-missile defenses in Guam, suggesting they're taking it much more seriously. So the question is, how seriously should we take it, and how worried are you? Well, I think um, when any of us look, uh, Jonathan, North Korea, we start to get worried. But uh, your question is apposite, because we need to ask ourselves what's new here that we haven't seen before. What's new here is, um, can be summed up in three words, and they're Kim Jong-un. Um, this guy is 28 years old, going on 29. Uh, he's an inexperienced leader by definition. <clears throat> and so the real concern, which those of us who watch these events closely are, con are focused on, is whether he will miscalculate in terms of thinking he can get away with what his father did in the last several years, which is a military provocation across the border, uh, previously the sinking of a South Korean frigate or the bombardment of a South Korean island, and thinking that he could replicate that to consolidate his domestic political position within North Korean politics. The problem with all that is newly elected South Korean President Park, I don't believe, has the political capital to simply turn the other cheek. I think uh, there will be enormous pressure on her to respond, and if she responds militarily, we then into the dynamics of escalation. That's where it starts to get scary. Now, what kind of role do you anticipate China playing? Uh, you yourself have said that you're starting to detect some signs of frustration, understandable in the Chinese, and um, question uh, greater questioning of just how, how worthwhile this problematic uh, relationship is for the Chinese. We've seen there was a, uh, an editorial last week questioning the relationship. China voted against uh, North Korea recently in the UN Security Council. Do you think there's a prospect for a real move away from North Korea by the Chinese or a willingness to put greater pressure on them? I think um, what we can say with confidence is there's now a debate mm -hmm. underway in Beijing about the future direction of North Korea policy. In the past, to the extent that there was a debate, it was a um, subterranean one. Now there is a large number of articles appearing from officials and from uh, those in the think tanks arguing the whole spectrum of this um, North Korean phenomenon and how it impacts on um, China's um, national interests. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, where it lands, it's too difficult to tell right now. Uh, but if you're trying to define a ledger and say what's on the side of the ledger of um, changing policy, it's we, China, because of North Korea, are beginning to see U.S. allies in the Western Pacific now cooperating much more directly on things like ballistic missile defense, which from a Chinese broader strategic perspective is a problem. <coughs> Two, uh, we face the possibility of escalation out of control through a provocation by Kim Jong-un across the border, uh, resulting in um, a serious conflict on the peninsula and China having no plan B. And then thirdly, the um, continued association with North Korea undermining China's long-term uh, desire to be a respected global great power. On the other side of the ledger, what have you got? You've got China's um, traditional uh, security policy view that a divided Korean Peninsula is best for them because it doesn't have an American ally uh, flush up against a Chinese land border, mm -hmm. let alone the possibility of American troops uh, allied to South Korea being flush up against uh, the Yalu River. 
Now, I don't think the latter would ever be a possibility. I don't think America would ever want that in the first place. But that in broad outline is the strategic calculus. I think this earlier set of arguments that I ran through about uh, the need for change are starting to gain more of an ascendancy in Beijing than the traditional maintenance of the status quo. Xi Jinping remains something of a cipher, at least to Americans. It's remarkable how poorly this very, very important leader is understood. I was struck when I was in China on the eve of the transition in October by how poorly he was understood by the Chinese as well. He was sort of a national Rorschach test where everyone read into him what they wanted to read into him. He's now been through at least two significant international crises and has um, embarked on a number of dramatic domestic initiatives as well. How do you rate him? now that he's four or so months into his job? It's more important, I think, how he's rated within China itself. Um, and having just been there in the last several days, my um, judgment is that his stocks are pretty high. Mm -hmm. uh, against the complexity of the domestic policy agenda, against the complexity of um, the uh, external security policy environment, um, he's actually Chinese would say generally he's had a pretty good start. Mm -hmm. There's a long way to go, though. In speaking of that, um, let me turn now to the American side, and, and we can see how, how you think she should respond as well. Um, in your March-April uh, article for Foreign Affairs Beyond the Pivot, you wrote that uh, the, the rebalancing um, uh, was, was uh, a good move and a good response to recent past few years of Chinese behavior, but only a start in what you argue needs to be a major reorientation in Chinese-U.S. relations. Briefly, what, what needs to happen next to keep the relationship on track? Well, I think um, the next stage mm -hmm. of this relationship, based on the realities of the first stage of the last several years, is now to find a mechanism to start closing the strategic trust deficit between the two countries. And my simple recommendation outlined in the article in Foreign Affairs is to do that through a program of regular summitry, to do so uh, on the basis of an agreed work program, to do so focused on uh, current <coughs> issues uh, of a global nature and the global rules-based order, regional confidence and security building measures, bilateral dialogue and hopefully agreement on rules of the road on cyber to step-by-step -step build strategic trust over time. Why do you need strategic trust, you might argue? Well, um, uh, so much of East Asia uh, is a um, strategic tinderbox uh, of um, barely sublimated nationalist tensions, cultural animosities, and in some cases racial tensions, that frankly you need all the strategic ballast you can draw upon uh, to manage any of these uh, issues if they happen to start spiraling out of control. And at present, that relationship of, shall I say, basic level strategic trust doesn't exist. So that's why I'd encourage um, the administration in the United States to uh, reach out and, um, and say, OK, President Xi Jinping, you say you want a new model of great power relations. That's what you say in all the publications. Let's sit down and talk about how we might fashion that. And here's our recommendation work program. Uh, why don't we see yours? And you suspect the Chinese would be receptive? I have learnt over many, many years not to predict um, uh, what uh, the Chinese might do in response to that. I think they would be foolish not to respond positively. Um, but uh, my overall argument is this. There is nothing to be lost to the United States by trying. Mm -hmm. And frankly, uh, to simply say, you, the Chinese, have put this concept out there, we, the Americans, would actually like to build um, a new form of relationship with you based over time on greater levels of strategic trust. Why don't we sit down and talk about that? You hear a lot when you read about China, when you talk to the Chinese, about deep ins insecurity in the Chinese psyche, um, uh, whether it comes from historical sources, uh, the legacy of colonialism, um, the trauma of the last 30 years. Um, whatever the cause, uh, national pathologies that keep China from acting like a uh, responsible international stakeholder and a typical status quo um, state power. It's a big question, but I'm, I'm wondering if you can give a short answer. What will it take till China 
starts acting like a quote-unquote normal great power, um, willing to play by the international rules of the game and engage in a full-blooded way in the international global architecture. I think the Chinese response to that question would be saying, um, was it normal for the West to colonize China over more than 100 years? Was it normal for uh, Japan to invade China and kill millions of its people? And if these are the sort of norms which um, were permissible among so-called civilized nations of uh, the West and modern nations uh, of Asia, then we've got a few question marks about those norms. Uh, and for the Chinese, that's not just a rhetorical position. It's actually driven by a profound level of national experience and national historiography. So you roll the clock onto the present, and remember, we can never completely just draw a line over the past. None of us are capable of doing that. Um, I think uh, China, for its own national interest reasons, now finds itself engaged in every global negotiation under the sun. And incrementally, what you will see more and more is the Chinese having to take positions on the structure of the order rather than standing simply to one side, as has been their preferred position uh, so many times in the past. This is a work in progress. It's going to take some time. It will not succeed, however, if we simply say to the Chinese the following. The international rules-based order is very good for you, like spinach, and you should have lots of it. Um, that's not going to work any more as it's going to work with um, someone you're trying to feed spinach to. Um, what is more likely to work is to say, do you want chaos in the international system? We don't. I don't think you do either. Uh, therefore, we need rules. These are the rules we've got. Why don't we s seek to work to strengthen them together so they benefit you, they benefit us, the United States, uh, and they benefit the rest of the world as well. That, I think, is a more productive way of proceeding. And the second argument is um, you in the future, China, want to protect your own intellectual property? Uh, well, let's find um, uh, a national interest reason for you then to give greater law enforcement teeth to the protection of uh, IP within your country, uh, parallel to what occurs in other countries as well. So it's frankly constructing the national interest arguments mm -hmm. which are attached to an international order uh, rather than, shall I say, preaching from on high. Well, as criminal as it is to cut this conversation short, we are out of time. So, Mr. Rudd, thank you so much for talking to Foreign Affairs. Always happy to talk to Foreign Affairs. Good magazine. Thank you.